Hi there! If you're new to this relatively new channel and don't know my other one, I'm legally required to inform you, in case you can't tell from all the beard on my neck, that I am a registered anime fan. And not just, you know, because I got caught streaming Demon Slayer in a public park or whatever. I'm into the hardcore shit, with mentally ill walrus taxi drivers and golfing cyborg mafiosos. I can and will find a connection between literally any topic you can think of and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. For example, did you know that Warner Brothers produces the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure anime? If you're a JoJo's fan, then by the end of this video, that knowledge will fill you with much dread, I think. To be clear, this video isn't about anime. It's about Western cartoons, which have really been catching up to anime and, in some respects, even surpassing it in terms of their storytelling and cinematic presentation over the last couple decades. And not just the shows that directly emulate anime like Avatar, either. From Adventure Time to Steven Universe to Over the Garden Wall to Gravity Falls to BoJack Horseman to Bob's Burgers to Rise of the TMNT, the bar for American animation has been raised across the board in every genre. And cartoons are even moving into new genres now. In particular, there's this new trio of American isekai, Disney's The Owl House and Amphibia, plus Cartoon Network's Infinity Train, which I've heard nothing but great things about and have really been looking forward to watching and maybe covering in a video whenever the anime industry decides to calm down with the shows a little. The false binary that cartoons have to be either exclusively for kids or late-night adult comedies has been obliterated, and the potential for animation to tell any kind of story we can imagine has finally been unlocked. Many of these shows, far too many to list now in the wake of the streaming boom, have spawned fan bases every bit as rabid and lore-obsessed as your average anime as a result. Not that the executives who actually own these shows seem to have noticed the difference. Pretty much every unimpeachable all-time animated classic I just named has been shuffled around the broadcast schedule or threatened with cancellation at some point because it wasn't moving enough toys or whatever. And the few lucky enough to avoid that fate were either absolute ratings behemoths or short enough to be over before the meddling really began. Animators in America, much like their Japanese counterparts, deal with constant disrespect and shamefully low pay from the men they make millions for. But they do get something out of that Faustian bargain. The chance to leave their mark on our culture. To put something beautiful and personal out into the world, which, for the rest of time, new people can discover and fall in love with, and maybe even be inspired by to create their own cool new thing that they won't get paid enough for. But that, too, will at least get to exist. It will at at least get to connect with people and keep connecting with people forever. And whatever else the suits choose to do, they can't take that away from these artists. Oh, wait, yes they can. Fresh off the heels of their brilliant decision to can a mostly finished $90 million Batwoman movie as a tax write-off at the same time as they're actively refusing to cancel a The Flash movie that stars a wanted sex criminal and alleged cult leader, the executives at Warner Brothers Discovery have made the executive decision to pull a whole fuckload of mostly animated shows off their streaming service, HBO Max. And not in the way you're probably used to with Netflix, where sometimes they lose the license to a show that you were watching and you have to go watch it elsewhere. No, these are all shows that Warner Bros. owns the entire IP to, including Infinity Train, OKKO, OK Aquaman King of Atlantis, hundreds of classic Sesame Street episodes, some of the most historically important American media of the last century, and even Elmo's new not too late night talk show. A few of these are also cancellations whose recently finished unaired seasons or movies will serve as tax write-offs for the brand, just like Batgirl and the no longer upcoming Scoob holiday special. Which is fucking heinous enough as it is. Like, imagine pouring an entire year or more of your life into creating a work of art only for some fuckhead accountant to tell your boss he can put a bigger hot tub on his new yacht if it never sees the light of day. 
Also, any resource distribution system that actively incentivizes not distributing a product that's already consumed the resources needed to make it is perhaps due for a serious reassessment, but I don't want to fixate on that because what happened to the shows that weren't canceled for tax purposes is, frankly, even sadder and more infuriating. So far as I can tell, and just to be clear, I'm not an expert, there doesn't seem to be any tax benefit to removing a piece of media that's already been released and had a chance to recoup some of its costs. So then we must ask, why? Because they want to stop paying residuals to the artists. Residuals, if you're not aware, are payments that actors, writers, and other unionized contributors to mass industrial art receive whenever their work is re-aired or redistributed. These payments, made standard years ago thanks to the Hollywood Actors and Writers Guilds, guarantee that at least a fraction of the profits generated by their work after the fact will always get back to them. And that's true even when there are no profits sometimes. So. It is totally possible for a studio to lose money on residuals. Generally speaking, though, that will only happen if the work in question already lost a bunch of other money elsewhere, more than can be recouped by licensing it out to broadcasters and what have you, because obviously the cost of those residuals is taken into account when setting the price for those licenses. Now, streaming kind of complicates this, because instead of airing one time on a fixed date or being sold one time as a Blu-ray or DVD, works live on streaming platforms forever, in theory. So instead of a one-time fixed fee, writers and actors get paid a percentage of a fixed rate based on the subscriber count of the platform their work is appearing on going by the logic that the content they've created is what keeps those subscribers on the platform. Which is objectively true, that's how streaming works. Some shows end up costing a platform more in licensing fees, production costs, and residuals than they make by directly attracting new subscribers with that show, but by presenting the subscribers drawn in by Squid Game or whatever with exclusive content that caters to a wide range of tastes, platforms can encourage users with those tastes to stick around after the big popular thing has fallen out of the public consciousness, eventually paying that money back and then some. This economic reality is baked into the very structure of streaming residuals, which decrease in cost year over year, the percentage falling off exponentially after the first three that a title is on a platform, and eventually bottoming out after 11 or 12 years at a fraction of what it used to be. In other words, the longer a platform keeps a title on its servers, the more of the profits that that title generates by simply existing on the platform go to the platform. So say for the sake of argument that the vocal talents of J.K. Simmons and beloved character actress Margot Martindale really are costing HBO Max way more than they're making on Infinity Train directly right now. Writer residuals are based on episode length, and each episode of Infinity Train is 11 minutes long, so it's definitely not that. Also, animation writing residuals get paid directly into animators' union healthcare plans instead of going to the animators, so perhaps it's just that Warner Brothers Discovery hates animators so much they want them all to get sick and die, but the actors costing too much seems a little more likely to me. Whatever the case, since Warner Bros. Discovery owns the IP and doesn't have to pay any licensing fees to keep it, it's still smarter in the long term to leave it up for people to watch and discover, or even just leave in their watch lists forever as one of the things they plan to get to before unsubscribing, because that keeps them subscribed. And that's without even taking into account the potential for the IP to grow over time, find a new audience, maybe sell a bunch of merch. Shit. If one of these titles finds a new audience because of this news and Warner Brothers decides that it makes economic sense to relist or license it to another platform later, they'll have to start paying that premium first year residual rate all over again. There are so many downsides to delisting an exclusive title from a streaming platform and so 
few upsides, yet they've done it to nearly 30 of them this month, plus several HBO Max original movies. So, we must once again ask, why? Why the hell would a company do something this hostile, not just to its own employees, but its own customers? Something that, in the long term, sure seems like it's gonna be a big net loss for them. Because big publicly traded companies don't give a fuck about the long term anymore. All that matters to them is the current fiscal year. And they give even less of a fuck what their employees or customers want from them. The only people Warner Bros. Discovery CEO David Zaslav is trying to keep happy with this are the shareholders of his newly merged company. And those shareholders can collectively make a whole fuckload of money from their shares if, following that big merger, Zaslav is able to demonstrate a significant increase in company profits year over year, which he could do by selling more good movies and shows to the public and increasing profits that way, but that takes talent and intelligence, so instead he's laying off almost a fifth of his workforce, writing off any projects that could maybe lose money and likely won't turn a massive immediate profit, and cutting off residuals for a bunch of different shows for the rest of the fiscal year. This isn't some canny business strategy to ensure the long-term viability of the platform and brand. This is simply an act of mass sacrifice to the one true god of our modern age, the line. Blood spilled upon its mighty altar in hopes that it will bless us by going up. And it is a brutal sacrifice indeed. Not only are these titles being pulled from the only platform that will likely ever have the rights to stream them, leaving their creators despondent that their own children who they created the shows for won't be able to watch them, many of their soundtracks have been pulled from every music streaming platform, and all content related to them has been scrubbed from every relevant social media platform that WB owns. Not just from Cartoon Network's Twitter, but their YouTube channel, which, in Infinity Train's case, means that the pilot episode, which has millions of views and thousands of comments dating back to the very start of its fandom is just gone. Not to mention a bunch of other promotional videos with unique edits and audio cues that nobody would have even bothered to save because, I mean, they're just YouTube ads and why would they ever go away? That shit's really gone, maybe forever. And just to add insult to injury, Warner Brothers has also immediately ceased manufacturing Infinity Train DVDs, which the residuals from those come out of the MSRP, so there's no way to lose money as long as they're selling. They went absolutely scorched earth with this move, so there's literally just no way to watch the show anymore besides piracy. And that's not me talking. The creator of Infinity Train says as much in his Twitter bio now. Technically, you can still buy the series through Google Play, Prime Video, and iTunes, where, thanks to this news, it's currently the top-selling show on the whole platform, but there's no telling when or if it will be delisted there too, or how long it will remain downloadable for people who've bought it if it is delisted. In many ways, the streaming industry has been great for anime, animation, and art in general. More media is more widely accessible today than at any point in human history, but there's no guarantee it will stay that way. Streaming services already put their libraries at risk simply by storing them in a centralized system where one catastrophic failure can wipe out unfathomable amounts of data. But on top of that, the dictates of for-profit business do very little to incentivize proper media preservation, and in some cases, like this one, actively disincentivize it. We face a very real risk of a lot of great new art just being lost to time forever, sooner than a lot of us realize. And 
I've come to realize that one of the only forces really standing against that terrible future is peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, a system where, as long as one person on a network has a file, everyone has access to it. Now, it's not a perfect system either, mind you, but at least it's decentralized with lots of redundancies and a very simple incentive to keep these things accessible. Anyone who loves a work of art will download and seed it. Simple as that. That realization, more than anything, is I think what's driven me away from my old hardline anti-piracy stance. I once made an argument many years ago that fans of anime and media in general have a certain moral imperative to support anime and media in general streaming platforms wherever they can, to give some money back to the creators of the art we love, and more importantly, to financially incentivize the creation and distribution of more lovable art. There was a lot wrong with that argument, and a lot more wrong with the whole video that surrounded it. Please check out our podcast episode, Times Jeff Was Wrong, if you want to hear me go over some more of those issues in more detail and apologize for being so wrong. But I still stand by that core sentiment. Right now, streaming platforms are the primary driving force behind the creation and distribution of not just anime, but all movies and television, and everyone who pays into them is, to some extent, supporting the creation of that kind of content for everyone who enjoys it, including pirates. I definitely wouldn't call it a moral imperative anymore, but I generally do think that paying for streaming platforms is a good thing to do that helps to keep existing art accessible and fuels the creation of more art. But that only holds true as long as these platforms are committed to giving us more art for our money, not taking away what we already have, not fucking over artists and their own customers purely for the sake of a year-end balance sheet. I no longer think you have a moral imperative to support streaming platforms, but if you're currently paying for an HBO Max subscription, I do think that you have a moral imperative to cancel it immediately and tell everyone you know to do the same. Because if this little accounting scheme of Zaslav succeeds, we are going to see other desperate streaming CEOs pulling the same bullshit, and a lot of streaming CEOs already seem kinda desperate right now. If it fails, though, if they lose enough subscribers to offset the costs they've already cut, that would send a powerful message to all of these platforms that bad media preservation is also bad business. Please, for the love of art, stop supporting HBO Max. You don't have to cancel your sub forever, just to the end of the fiscal year. And if there's something on there you absolutely can't wait that long to watch, well, I'm sure you can find it wherever you go to watch Infinity Train. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from the high seas.